All right, welcome back to Computer Science E76. So this is our third lecture on iOS, but first a teaser for the staff's choice of projects. Uh, I have here a four-letter word in English, and I would like you to guess the letters of this word. Give me a letter. L. Okay, I heard L, and L is not among the letters. Uh, e uh, is among the letters. R, R is among the letters. <laughs> Close. So it's not beer, otherwise there'd be two E's there, but I did hear B. Okay, so bear is indeed it. So this might feel a little familiar to a childhood game. Uh, this is what we might call hangman, this word game whereby I've chosen a English word of some number of letters. You know only the number of letters and you iteratively guess these letters and hopefully figure out the word before you run out of letters. So to make the game interesting, we wouldn't go on for as many as 26 possible choices. We'd cap it at like six possible choices or eight so that there's at least a little bit of competition between you and me. But um, that game very quickly gets boring. Uh, and so let me instead choose a five letter word here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and I'm going to fast forward for the sake of time and pretend that we've done uh, this letter. You've guessed this letter. Uh, uh, this letter, this letter, and the letter I forgot about. <laughs> Um, and suppose we're at the point in the game, at the very climax, where you have just one guess left, because you've used up all your previous guesses to get to this point. And so now the challenge is beat me at this game by guessing the remaining letter and thus word. So what is your guess? Q. <laughs> all right, don't be difficult. So it's not Q, so I'll give you one more. OK, so I heard you. But unfortunately, I heard you first, but I was thinking of A, the word was thus doable, which means you all lost because you guessed you. Now, that's actually a bit of a white lie because I was actually thinking of double with a U, but as soon as you guessed that first, I changed my mind, thereby kind of sort of cheating. And thus was born the game Evil Hangman, whereby I, or in turn the computer, guesses a word of some number of letters, but every time you guess a letter, I change my mind, and I change the actual word to a word that does not have any of the letters that you have just guessed are in the word. So I'm trying to constantly dodge your guesses. Now, if you start with a large number of words, what you'll find in the interesting computer science aspect of this is that you've got some large data structure and memory containing all the possible English words. And as you guess letters, you start to whittle that list down, whittle it down, whittle it down. But if we're starting with tens of thousands of words, well, with only just a few guesses, you're not necessarily going to get that word very easily. And so in this example here, where we uh, granted fast forwarded through the story a bit, you get to this point in the game and you, the human, at least if you've got just one uh, guess left, you're bound to lose. The evil computer is bound to win. So with the staff's choice of assignments this week, what you'll be implementing is not the boring game of Hangman, but the far more interesting game of Evil Hangman, which will allow us an opportunity to explore some of the Objective-C foundation classes, various data structures, whether arrays or lists or vectors or sets, whatever it is that you need to employ for this project. And the goal is to going to be to implement what's called a utility application, or at least that's the template on which it's based. And this is one of those probably familiar iPhone apps where there's one main screen where you'll actually play the game. So when you spawn this app, you'll see uh, dashed lines representing the letters as I did here. Uh, when you click a certain button, though, that view will flip around to the so-called flip side where you'll have some options. The options being how long do you want the words to be? How many guesses do you want to allow the human? Then you click save and it flips back around to the game and the game can now proceed. And so this will be an opportunity to actually write the first interesting applications, far more interesting than this past week's Hello World application. And not only will you get to experiment and hopefully acclimate to the various features of Xcode, of Objective-C, to the various uh, UI uh, frameworks that come with the iOS SDK, you'll also get to do a bit of thinking when it comes to actually implementing that algorithm. And what's nice with Objective-C uh, is that you do get a whole lot of functionality with these various frameworks. So we'll begin to scratch the surface of uh, just how to do this today. So that PDF will be posted either late tonight or by morning and uh, will be the focus of the next couple of weeks. Tommy's walkthrough will be this Thursday. For those who can't attend in person on campus, it will be filmed. So we will have a, a walkthrough whereby it will help get you started on that 
project. So that is their evil hangman. So where do we go tonight? So we finally, last week, dove in to actual iPhone applications, but very boring ones at that. We pretty much implemented Hello World toward uh, the tail end of last week's lecture, and we did it with the simplest of possible iOS templates, the so-called window-based application. And it can't get more generic than that. You've got a window, and that's it. There's no actual interesting templating code going on there. But today, we'll look in more detail at some of the templates that ship with iOS, but also point out that these are really just meant to simplify your life a little bit. You can certainly always start with that template there and build your your way up. It simply helps to save time if we actually learn a little something about the other templates, particularly because they really emphasize this paradigm of programming. Model view controller, which we certainly looked at in the Android part of the course, and you'll see that this really is ingrained into Mac OS and iOS programming. So we'll point out the details there, and we'll focus specifically today on what are generally called view controllers, the sort of brains of an application that manage one or more views. And in the case of this evil hangman application, the idea ultimately will be that you'll have two so-called view controllers, one of which controls the front side of the application, one of which controls the back side of the application. And somehow we'll see, through a technique called delegation, will they be able to intercommunicate somehow so that together they form one full application. So recall that MVC generally describes a world like this. And sometimes these arrows are drawn in slightly different ways. But the general mantra here is that the controller is allowed to talk to the view, the view being the presentation layer, the controller being the brain. And then the model is really your data. So recall two weeks ago when we started talking about just Objective-C, we talked about students and student classes and such. And that was our discussion really of a model. If we wanted to model as a verb uh, this notion of a student, well, we were able to encapsulate things like a name or an ID or an age and details like that. So we really began our look at iOS talking about models. But the whole idea here with MVC is to try to decouple these three primary components as best we can so that in particular, um, you can actually create, and it makes all the more sense these days now that the iPad exists, multiple views potentially for an application, but the same underlying code base, the same controllers, the same models potentially, but you display that data differently depending on whether it's an iPad or an iPhone, or it's an iPhone like this or an iPhone like that. So you have a number of different options. So we'll begin to scratch the surface of that as well today. Um, a look at what's on the horizon, though. Per the front page of the course's website, we have the Google Calendar here, which not only lists sections, both online and local, and Tommy's walkthrough. But the teaching fellows also have a number of seminars, as we're calling them, coming up. Um, the first will be led by JP next week, and we'll focus on table views. So more on that in tonight's section, if you can join us. Otherwise, that'll go online as well. Interface builder issues and multi-tab applications, which we'll probably look at ever so briefly today. But JP will go into more detail there. Bob will uh, discuss uh, this feature of push notifications, getting those little badges, for instance, on the home screen green icons or little pop-ups when something's gone on in the background, the notion of code signing and testing. And then a week or so thereafter, we'll have a couple uh, more such seminars, um, one on iPad design patterns by Larry, focusing very specifically on the iPad, though today we might take a quick look or next week at some iPad-specific stuff. And then Tom, in a week's time, on, uh, in a couple weeks' time, on iOS audio capability. So that'll help round out some of the topics that we simply couldn't fit into, say, lectures and sections alone. So schedules up there. They will be filmed if you can't make them. So FYI, those are on the horizon. So here's where we left off last week. We essentially pulled up Xcode 4. We had a number of template options here. And the first one of which that we looked at was this window-based application. Window-based application is the sort of simplest boilerplate here, just as an FYI, because I constantly make this mistake when creating additional files. Notice that you always have this decision point for iOS or macOS templates. Make sure you're getting into the habit of the top ones, at least for the class. I very often have accidentally created some file based on Mac OS and then only a few minutes later realized why it looks slightly different than I'm used to. So just FYI, there's some commonalities there. So we'll focus on an iOS application. I'm going to focus on a window-based application. And recall that when I hit Enter, I'm prompted for a couple of things. A product name. I'm going to go ahead and just call this Hello Label. 
much like last week. Company identifier, um, once if you own iOS hardware, an iPad, an iPhone, an iPod Touch, and ultimately want to start installing the staff's choice or the student's choice project onto your own hardware, this becomes relevant there. You have to jump through a couple of hoops in order to actually get your code onto an iOS device. It's much more involved than in the Android world. Um, we'll assist you with that, but just FYI for now, this relates to that process. And just to emphasize per this first setup specification, unless you want to, you do not need to pay the $99 or $299 uh, to do anything regarding iOS for this portion of the course. If you do own an iOS device, we will circulate within a week or so instructions for how you can tell us, the course, what your so-called Apple ID is, your email address, uh, that you used for the setup project to get registered on Apple.com. We will then send you what's called an invitation to join our provisioning team, uh, at which point you can then, through the instructions we'll provide, tell us what your own personal iPhone or iPod's uh, device ID is, a unique identifier. We'll click some links and such on our end. And then long story short, you will ultimately be able to install onto your machine a digital certificate that allows you to install your program onto your phone. A few too many steps, um, but we will do our best to simplify it for us. So this will relate to that process soon. As for device family, so you'll see at least with the simplest of templates, we can choose iPhone or iPad or Universal. Um, you, if you play around with these, you'll see that what you get out of the box is a little bit different. In particular, the nib files, the .xib files, are just going to look a little different because the layout of the UI will be different. If you choose Universal, you'll actually find that you'll get some additional files. There's a few ways to do Universal apps, which we may talk about over time. Universal meaning they work on both. You can do it with multiple nib files, multiple code bases, or just multiple projects all together. For now, just because it fits nicely on the overhead projector here and quite legibly, I'll typically, just by out of habit, go with iPhone. Uh, but we'll discuss differences as they arise. I'm going to leave these other things unchecked because we don't need something called core data for saving data locally just yet or unit tests. We're going to keep the code I get spit out for me quite simple. So hello label is the name. That's all I changed on this screen. I hit enter. I'm being prompted to save it somewhere. I'm just going to put it on my desktop for now. You should probably choose a more permanent location. And then what we have, once I've done that, is a screen like this. All right, so where did we uh, go from here last week? So recall that at the top left, we have our groups of files and folders and all this. And I only care for the moment about my user interface. So I'm going to expand a bunch of these triangles. And we're going to see that, all right, there's my main window.nib file. This is the file that was formerly edited by a program called Interface Builder. Now it's integrated into Xcode itself. This is where you get the graph paper effect if you've done the setup project thus far. And you get a little window here that just so happens to resemble quite, uh, quite closely the dimensions of the iPhone itself. And you see a little hint of a battery icon at top right. So all I did last time to get us started was open this panel on the right hand side under view. And the spec reminds you of that feature. And then I have all these little objects down here. And you might see some familiar things like sliders and switches, activity indicator views, all this sorts of fun stuff. But I'm just going to go with a simple one of label and drag that, oh, say, into the middle of my application. I'm now going to double click it and type hello label or something to that effect. I could have notice under my uh, attributes in, uh, inspector up here. There's so many options here. It's kind of like the Microsoft Word approach to configurability. But most of it's pretty self-explanatory. At the top, I see text. Uh, then I see mention of alignment, font size, and so forth. So a lot of this you can just tinker or turn a blind eye to for now. But notice I could have typed that same text up here. Uh, now notice my centering. I'm a bit anal, so this is kind of bothering me that it's no longer centered. It doesn't suffice to just click Center because it's not going to go anywhere in this case. I actually have to widen the bounding box for this thing. So much like any graphical tool, I can do a little something like this, then drag it over here. And you'll see that you often get these little ruler lines by default that just help you lay things out a reasonable distance from the screen. It'll help you align things in the center, on the left and the right. It's pretty helpful when it comes to that, but you can certainly ignore. So this is pretty much all I did last time. So I'm going to go ahead and save it now. And I can either hit Command R to run this application or more explicitly click the triangle at the top left. And once I do that, what I get up in my screen, uh, why'd this happen? Uh, stupid Xcode. Pretend the following t five seconds aren't happening. Uh, 
Okay, there we go. Uh, for some reason, I've noticed this happened before, and if anyone has the explanation for it, I'd love to know. Sometimes the iPhone uh, options drop out of the list, uh, which is a little strange. So now I'm going to quickly replicate this. When in doubt, assume it's a bug and or your fault. <laughs> Unclear which one it is here. So hello label. I'm going to drag this back over here. Over here, I'm going to center it, and that's it. I want to keep this super simple. I'm going to go ahead and now run this thing. So now I get the I/O of a simulator popping up by default, and that's it. All right, so what is there not here? Well, there's really not a model. There's no mention of students. There's really nothing of interest. It's just some UI stuff. So it feels like there's definitely a view of some sort. But in fact, really what I'm doing is dropping this label on what's generally called the window, the rectangular area that you get by default, which itself is an instance of a class called UI view. In fact, most of these objects that you'll see down here are some form of an object uh, class called UI view. And so what we'll see as we start to play more with Interface Builder and the like is that as you design things, whether in code as we'll do tonight or with Interface Builder, this drag and drop interface, you can think of the window or the biggest UI view here as kind of like a transparency or a canvas. And then you take these smaller UI views, these things like buttons and controls and sliders and labels, you stick them onto that transparency and then you present to the, whole, to the user the underlying transparency that you've stuck everything else on. So that's generally what we did here, one view on top of another. And because of the template code, the rest of this was just kind of magical. It just kind of worked before I even wrote a line of code. But we'll look underneath the hood in a moment. Then we'll begin to do something more interesting with our UI. But question in back. Oh, good question. Some of the font faces. Um, that's possible. If you have some locally installed fonts, maybe they're showing up in the list because it's probably leveraging some Mac OS um, font um, code base. But I'm not sure. I've, to be honest, never really strayed far from some of the default fonts. It's a good question. I believe you can leverage true type fonts if you get them on there, but don't quote me on that because I've not um, bothered doing much with different text based on fonts alone. But I can, uh, I'll make a mental note to take a look. Yeah? Indeed. So actually, let's take a very quick look underneath the hood. In general, you should not need to do this only because it's meant to be managed by the application and not the human. But I'm going to go ahead and right click on the nib file at top left there. By default, this template gives me main window.nib. If I go ahead and show this in the finder, sure enough, there inside of my project directory somewhere is this .xib file. I'm going to go ahead and open this with, let's say, text edit, something very simple. And indeed, if I maximize this, all we have in this file, even though it's a .xib file, the x actually denotes Xcode or XML, um, is XML text. So what's really happening here, and we'll see this in more detail in the next, next uh, exercise, is that a nib file is essentially a serialization in text of objects that are going to be instantiated for you by uh, the application one run. So you can either instantiate objects, as we've seen in the past two weeks, by calling alloc and init or similar type mechanisms. And you can do this very explicitly manually in code. Or you can start to drag and drop some of these puzzle pieces from within Xcode's interface builder interface. And that gets saved in some semi-cryptic way in this XML file, such that when you then run that application subsequently, what the device does is it reads into memory this nib file. It understands all of these various elements and attributes that Apple has decided represent a nib file. And it does all of those allocs and inits and such for you. And so you'll see in a moment, we're going to start dragging and dropping things in a very wiring way, whereby we attach one object to another, kind of like you would assign a pointer from one object to another. Well, we're going to do that graphically with wires. But that same information gets stored somewhat cryptically in an XML file so that it can be saved um, to inside of the application's bundle. Um, so there, an alternative approach, frankly, would be if the interface builder uh, UI allowed you to drag and drop and then it automatically generated code for you, which actually might be a little nicer because then you can really see and understand what's happening. The downside, of course, with that is that if you then go in and manually tinker, it's very hard then to keep those UIs in sync. So presumably that's the justification for this more proprietary 
format. But that is, in fact, the nib file. And you shouldn't need to ever go poking around there yourself. As an aside, a plist file, there's a, which you see mention of here, though this is a, a variant thereof, um, those two are stored as XML property lists. And we'll use one such file uh, in Tommy's section today, as well as in this upcoming project. They're just key value pair files. All right, any other questions on hello label? All right, let's make it more interesting. So let's go ahead and do this. I would like to get to the point of actually writing an application that takes user input and produces output, not statically, something that's a little more dynamic. So I'd like to create, let's say, an application that has a text field, much like a web page or a web form would. I want to be able to type in my name or whatever in there on the keyboard and then hit enter. And then I want to be greeted nicely by my application saying, hello, David, or hello, Dan, or whoever it is that's typed in their name. So you can imagine dragging and dropping this interface pretty easily. So let's start there. Let me go ahead and open Xcode. I'm going to, for now, stick with this window-based template, only because I don't want any distractions of pre-generated code. I want to focus only on the minimal uh, setup. So we're going to do this. I'm going to call this nib1. Um, as an aside, though, I'm going to do some of the coding tonight on the fly and some of it prefabbed for time's sake. Know that you have all such uh, copies here if you'd like to follow along at home. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create nib1. I'm going to put it on my file system, and I have the exact same template that I started with just a moment ago. I'm going to dive in now, though, first to the code files. I want to make sure I understand exactly what I'm getting myself into, because now I'm going to have to start writing some code as soon as I've wired up my UI. So if you've done the project setup, you'll find that your hand is held pretty well through these various files, some of which are uninteresting, some of which are actually doing very useful things. When in doubt, whenever you look at uh, one of our projects that the staff has bundled up, uh, if you're following along with one of the recommended textbooks or some other book or just online examples, frankly, a good place to start just so that you're uh, painting a picture in your mind is just main.m. Nine times out of 10, there's not going to be anything interesting in there that's not boilerplate, but at least begins to tell the story. As in C, main starts the function running. Uh, here we have mention of an auto release pool, which we'll encounter uh, again and again. But this is where the magic starts to happen. UI application main is really what kickstarts your application. And that function does not return until your application is quit or terminated or somehow crashes. At that point, the so-called pool is released. Return value, whatever that is, is returned. Curly brace, that's it. As soon as main ends, your program ends. So that means the real interesting stuff must be inside of UI application main. Well, what's going on there? Well, let's actually take a look at uh, main window dot nib. So this is the template that we started with before. Right now there's nothing there. But notice that on the top here, there's these little icons that are kind of hiding some details, but ultimately are going to save us some time. Notice per the spec that by default, when you first installed Xcode, your window is going to look a little more like this. And those icons, unless you know what they mean, probably aren't all that helpful. So you can just drag and plop that out there or click a little arrow at the bottom so that now there's at least some English text. So this file is mainwindow.nib. This begs the question, who created this? Who's responsible for having given me mainwindow.nib? Well, therein lies the origin of this notion of files owner. Who owns this mainwindow.nib file? So I'm going to go ahead and highlight files owner there. And now I'm zoomed in, so you can't see it. But over on the right now, there's going to be some juicy details. If I scroll over to the right here, Notice that if I expand my inspector's view, all of these various configuration details here, I can see what this uh, main window.nib really is, or what the file's owner really is. Who owns this nib file? Well, apparently, the file's owner that's responsible for having uh, given me or running this nib file is UI application. So that's kind of familiar sounding, right? In main.m, there was mention of the UI application. And so essentially, main is handing off control of the application to this class. Now, UI application is purpose in life is to run my program. Now, this guy, UI application, actually kind of punts on that job altogether. We're not going to write UI application per se. In fact, what's UI application? has is a delegate, a class that it has decided is going to implement or run this program for me. So it's yet again passing the buck. So we've gone from main uh, to the function to the UI application class to now the so-called delegate. And of the various options up here, which is probably the class that's actually implementing my program? 
So it's this nib1 app delegate. So at the top, we keep seeing files named like this. My project is called nib1. I get pre generated for me nib1 app delegate.h, nib1 app delegate.m. So Apple here is essentially handing you some boilerplate code that if you start to write lines of code in there, the code's going to get run, and you are now, you've now been, been delegated control. Of this application. So again, we keep passing the buck, passing the buck, passing the buck. Finally, it stops with you. So that means we can now start writing code inside of those two files there, and soon even more files than that. Now let's just see what else is going on here. First responder, we'll come back to.、Um, but for now, notice that if I control click or right click, On files owner, there's going to be some mentions of outlets here or referencing outlets. This will make hopefully more sense in just a moment, but you can think of all of these icons here and all of the classes we ultimately write as potentially having what I called like electrical sockets last week, just a connector that you can plug something into. So the idea here is that we want to plug into my UI application, aka、uh, files owner. The delegate. I just need a connection. I just need a pointer saying this guy is in charge. How is that manifested in this little window here? Well, again, I control or right click to open this thing. And now notice that the files owner has an outlet called delegate. This is just a pointer. And that pointer is pointing at what object? The app delegate. So it's pointing at, and we'll see this in just a moment when I expand the window. It's,、uh, it's a little gray on the screen here. It's hard to see, but the delegate. Uh, outlet is connected to on the right hand side nib1a dot dot dot. What is that? Well, let me just expand the window. So, nib1 app delegate. So, somehow or other, these two objects are coupled, in this case, visually with a line or、uh, conceptually with、uh, or in code with some kind of pointer from one to the other. Now, Who, where is my call to alloc for the app delegate? Well, here's where Interface Builder, or where these nib files, kind of hide some details. Below this line here, that's called objects, are all of the objects that are going to be automatically allocked for me because they are mentioned in this nib file. So you see mention of a nib1 app delegate. Well, what in the world is that? I definitely didn't write anything with spaces. Well, as an aside, as I mentioned in the spec, the spaces are stupid. This is just Xcode's way of taking your file called nib1 app delegate and sticking in spaces to make it supposedly more human readable, but that's all that's coming、uh, from. If I click on this once, as I did before, scroll to the right, what is the class that,、uh, of which this object、uh, is an instantiation of? Well, there it is, nib1 app delegate. So, because some engineer at Apple, or at least the template here, has essentially put a, this little yellow uh, uh, sphere here,、uh, rather, yeah, this, sorry, this.、Uh, Little yellow cube here, next to which is the name nib1 app delegate. Because that icon appears in the nib file, that means when you run this application, you will get one object of class nib1 app delegate allocked for you and somehow wired up to any other objects in memory. Where is that wiring from? Well, when I right clicked a moment ago, that little visual wire between the delegate outlet and this app1,、uh, app nib1 app delegate object will be created for you. So、it's kind of a lot to digest, but the point here ultimately is that Xcode is hiding some of these details, instantiating these objects for you, and connecting them in a way、um, that you would、uh, expect based on where, how you've dragged and dropped. Window, same thing. A little rectangle that represents the glass screen. You kind of get that one for free, but it's similarly wired up. In fact, if I Right click on my own object. I didn't even do this. Recall, I have not dragged or dropped or written anything at this point, but notice that my nib1 app delegate itself has an outlet called window. This is just going to be a pointer, we'll see, called window. It's apparently wired up to what? Capital window. Well, that's that object. So there's all of these wires, these extension cords connecting these various objects, and this is what we get out of the box before we even do anything.、Whew. All right, any questions? Yeah. Where you can see a model of all of these relationships? I don't think so. The, best, the way to see the various relationships is to look at them iteratively in turn with right clicking or control clicking, and then you see this little summary.、Yeah. Other questions? All right. So, 
whew, let's start to actually implement something. It seems that we need to know a little something about nib1 app delegate. Well, my font is making this look a little more overwhelming than it is, but this again is prefabbed code. And let's start with the simpler file, the .h file. It's probably going to be easier to uh, digest, and indeed it is. So in the .h file that is called nib1 app delegate, notice there's really not much going on there. Now, I mentioned before that this thing has a pointer in it, an outlet. What is that outlet called? So it looks like it's called window, right? Even though some of this stuff is probably new here, we talked about property, we talked about non-atomic and retained. Didn't really talk about this thing yet, so ignore it. UI window, we haven't really talked about that, but that's the class name that implements this notion of the rectangular glass screen. Star denotes pointer, so window. So because there is this line here in my code with that star window, that explains why when I right clicked on this object in the graphical interface of Xcode that I actually saw the word window in lowercase. That's why it exists. So in fact, what we'll start to see is anytime you write code that you want to make sure you can wire up with an outlet, so to speak, with a line from one object to another in Interface Builder on the graph paper. If you specify IB outlet, that's just a clue to Xcode to say, make sure that when this guy right clicks somewhere, you see this outlet. So in fact, for those more familiar with C, IB outlet is actually sharp defined to be the empty string, quote unquote. So when it's actually, the code's actually compiled, that goes away completely. This is kind of a sort of internal hack, if you will, to get the GUI to understand that it should show the human and a, and a graphical outlet that we can wire up in just a moment. Now, we got this for free. What's this? Well, this is why it all works. Because Xcode has generated, generated some template code that says this class, whose name just came into being, nib1 app delegate, a derivation of my project name. What's interesting is that, one, it descends from NS object, as all of our classes thus far have. But it implements, apparently, this thing. What is this generally called between angled brackets? It's a protocol. So we mentioned those briefly last time, but a protocol is sort of akin to Java's interface. This means this class must implement some number of methods that are part of the protocol called UI application delegate. Don't quite know what those are yet, but we can infer as much when we now look at the sample code in the .m file. And this is the last file to look at before we get to start dragging and dropping. So in here, has a little bit of code, but thankfully most of its comments. And in fact, these various methods are the methods defined as part of that protocol. So the UI application delegate protocol says that you should really implement this method, and this one, and this one, and the one up top. Now, right now, there's no code in there. And I could actually delete all of these, and it wouldn't be a big deal if I'm not going to use them. But let's focus on the one method that's actually doing something. So at the very top of this file, this is my implementation of nib1 app delegate. I'm synthesizing that property called window, and I'm assigning it implicitly in IVAR, an instance variable called underscore window. That's not strictly necessary, but again, just a convention to make super clear what are my uh, instance variables versus my local variables. Now, this is a little ugly to read at 20 point font here, but the name of this method is application did finish launching with options. And it takes two parameters. So what does this thing take? It apparently takes a pointer to an application. And it apparently takes a, a dictionary, a pointer to a dictionary, a hash table of launch options. So this is the final step of magic. After this, I'm kind of on my own when it comes to writing this program. What uh, the uh, SDK is going to do for me is ensure thanks to the template code that's been handed to me, thanks to the various connections that we saw visually in the nib file, that the last thing that happens before the, it's completely up to me to start writing code is this method gets called. So this is what kickstarts the entire application and where I take over. So what's going on in here by default? Well, we saw this last week. Um, this object, the app delegate, has a property called window. So self.window invokes the getter for that. This method here, make key and visible, this makes my window, which at this point in the story is the only window. There's just one rectangular screen that we're looking at so far, makes it the key window, which means it's going to respond to any keyboard input or touches on the screen and make it visible, which makes it actually visible. So the screen has some actual content on it. And that's it. Now we're kind of off and running. Unfortunately, when we run this, the effect is kind of underwhelming. But the code will work right out of the box before I even do anything. 
That's what I get, a visible window with nothing on it, until I start overlaying a UI label or something like that, which we did prior to this example. All right, so now we get to start doing something interesting, so let's do that. Let's go into the nib file, and let's go ahead and give me a few, a couple widgets here. I'm going to drag a text field up here. I'm going to drag a button up here. And now I'm just going to configure it a little just to get a little more familiar with the UI. So on the button, I'm going to double click it and just call that go. Uh, the text field, I'm going to make this bigger just so that I can actually fit, say, a person's name more reasonably. I'm just going to drag and drop this to where it suggests that I stop. Now you have all these various inspectors up here. Right now I'm on the uh, identity or class inspector. I'm going to go to the attributes inspector, and this is more of the aesthetic one. And I just want to be kind of nice and uh, web 2.0-ish here and give it a placeholder like name. All right, so now we have over here, and that font's a little small, so I'm going to click the font icon, and I'm going to change the font to say be 14 points. And so now what I have, much like a web page, is a grayed out name placeholder text, a button called go, and let's see what happens now. So I've dragged two view objects, a UI label and a UI, rounded rect a UI button, onto my window. And notice to be clear, I am my, on my window. The object I've selected here is this rectangular window here, and notice that as children of this window, subviews as they're called, Xcode is showing me the two objects, the label and the button that I've now dragged and dropped. So where the whole story is in sync. All right, I'm getting a little antsy. I want to see my application progressing, so I run it, and it's pretty good, right? So this iPhone programming is really easy. So what can I now do with this thing? Well, look at this. I didn't even have to implement a keyboard. I just have to click the text field, and I can then say Shift D A V I D. All right, return. Okay, feels like a bug. Go. Feels like a bug. All right, so in fairness, I haven't really done anything interesting just yet, but I've created the UI. So here's the advantage of this thing called Interface Builder, or the graphical screen within Xcode. It just gets you going quickly with at least more traditional interfaces, but we'll see in just a bit. I can throw away almost all of my nib stuff and just do it all in code, which you'll want, so which you'll want to do um, if your interface wants to get a little more interesting or a little less dependent on the built-in widgets and such, or if you just don't like all these details being hidden on you and serialized in some XML file, you'd really like to see the lines of code, you can certainly roll the code yourself. So I want to start doing something now such that this program actually works. Now at the end of the day, I want to be able to click go and then have a little alert window pop up and say hello dot dot dot, where dot 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 is whatever the user typed in. Hello David. We'll see in a moment that's going to be called a UI alert. That's the class that's going to help with that little pop up window. But I kind of have to now wire this GUI up to my actual code. So now how can I go about doing this? Well, I kind of learned these lessons of MVC, and I remember that the, the con so-called controller is the brains of an application. I could kind of cut some corners here, because I have a class that I'm kind of sort of writing, that app delegate. I could write methods in there and kind of wire my UI to the delegate, but that's, again, kind of blurring this line or kind of cheating, cutting some corners, and for more sophisticated applications, you really want to put very minimal code into that nib1appdelegate.m file and just reserve that for some of the lowest level functionality, like what do I do if I'm running out of memory? Or what do I do if the user hits the, the circular home button and I have to be backgrounded? So for the very uh, low level native functionality, that's the kind of stuff that goes in there. Your custom code that's implementing this silly little interface, well, that should really go in my own classes. So I kind of want to create something like a controller class. So how can I go about doing this? Well, let's do this. Thankfully, in a moment, we'll, in a bit, we'll see how to do this more easily with some of the prefab code, but so that we're really understanding how all this stuff comes into being. I'm going to do this. At the top right, I'm going to right click on my folder here, and I'm going to choose New File. And you can alternatively go to the File menu, and there's any number of ways to do these things. But the goal right now is to create a new file, because I want to create my own controller. So two weeks ago, we had a whole lot of student classes, student.m, uh, student.h, and the like. I don't need a model for now. It's going to be super simple. But I do need a controller. I don't care you know, what I call this. I'm just going to call it controller. So I'm going to make my own custom class. So again, here, I'm moving over to the right. And notice it's by default selected Mac OS X, which will just give me slightly different template code. Let's go up here to Cocoa Touch, then select very generic Objective-C class. 
and it tells me I'm going to get an Objective C class with a header that includes the foundation framework. So that's pretty useful. I get uh, access to NS strings and stuff like that. What do I want it to be a subclass of? Almost always, NS object is fine. So I'm going to click Next there. Uh, as an aside, as an FAQ, don't accidentally type your class name there. Things will break quickly. Leave it as a subclass of whatever you're given. But name your class here. So I'm going to literally call this controller, for lack of a more creative name. I'm going to hit Enter. And now I have, at the top left of my uh, groups and such, I have two new files that Xcode gave me for free, controller.h and controller.m. So in those two files now, can I start to write code that aren't going to get executed automatically? It's ultimately going to be up to me to somehow wire my existing code, the .m file, or the GUI in Interface Builder to this controller file. But we'll get there. So let's see what I get for free. In controller.h, what do I get? Eh, not all that much. There's really nothing going on there. All right, that's good, because I'd rather not have to learn something new. So controller.m, what do I get? Even simpler. All right, so really this is a template. Now, frankly, you could have created an empty text file yourself and typed all this out. So realize that Xcode's either for better or for worse, making your life, uh, well, better or worse. So what can I actually do here? Well, um, conceptually, I really do want to somehow connect that text field from my GUI and that button from my GUI to my code. I need program I'm a programmer. I need programmatic access, the ability to type keywords and statements such that I can control those things that I very easily dragged and dropped. So what do I need to define in order to connect GUI to code? What do, what do we call them? Uh, so, prop not, oh, well, it is properties, but in this context, the keyword was? I'm hearing a lot of good answers, but not, not the right one. Outlets? Did anyone say outlets? OK, if you said outlets, you're correct. All right, or at least you're correct in as much as I'm looking for that word. So what is an outlet? An outlet really is going to be incarnated as a property in Objective-C code that allows me to have literally a pointer to some GUI type object, like a label or a button. So I can define this actually in a couple ways. Let me do it the very deliberate, very pedantic way. It's going to go in my .h file. I'm going to leave the inside the curly braces blank, but I'm going to say property. Uh, just because I know where I'm going with this, but very often this is a common boilerplate approach. I'm going to use non-atomic because I'm not doing anything fancy with threading. Retain because it's going to be a pointer and retains almost always for now the way to go, except for strings where we used copy. So let's go with retain. Uh, it needs to be an outlet. So I just learned this new keyword, IB outlet. So I'm going to put that in there. And then what do I want a pointer to? Well, let's do the button first. So I just happen to know that that is the class called UI button, and I need star, and I will call it just button. We'll keep it super simple. All right, so now watch what happens here. It's yelling at me in yellow because I'm not actually using this somewhere. I'm not even synthesizing it. So let's, let's make Xcode happy. Go to the .m file, and how do I synthesize this? What's the syntax? OK, yeah, it's synthesize. It's kind of telling me what to type. The property is called button. And now if I just say semicolon, this will automatically give me an instance variable called button. But just to be consistent with Apple's current paradigm and my own preference for having underscores in front of instance variables, I'm going to say actually back it with an IVAR called underscore button. But that's not strictly necessary there. All right, so now the yellow flags are all gone. So it's not yelling me at me anymore. So now let me go back to that nib file. And in this nib file, I've not done anything with the text field, but take notice of this. Um, I have, if I right click on my button, look at all of these possible connections that I can make to this simple little button. So it turns out that much like we saw in HTML5 and the web and in Android, there's a whole lot of things in a mobile environment that can trigger events, especially now that we have touch screens. You can have the action of touching down, touching up, dragging, pinching, scrolling. There's any number of events that can get triggered from various UI widgets. And for buttons, these are the possible things that might apply. They might not all apply because all of these widgets actually descend from a more generic UI control. And so the ones we're probably going to care about here is touch up inside. So touch up inside of the button is the, the event that represents the action of touching something uh, and lifting your finger up. So unfortunately, I don't have anything to connect that to. Notice at the moment, nothing is connected to that um, to that event. Notice I can start dragging, but I don't really have a terminus for this thing because what object does not appear in my nib file at the moment? 
Yeah, controller. So right now I'm at this awkward moment where I've got some code, it's ready to go. I got an outlet in my controller class, but I graphically can't wire my existing GUI to that object because I haven't told XBuilder to give me a controller object in my nib file. So at this moment in time, if I were to compile and run this program, yes, I've defined and declared a class called controller, but I've never once called what class method to instantiate it. Alloc. There's no mention of alloc, which means I'm not going to get it allocked at all unless it also appears as an icon here. Now, again, we'll see in a bit how we can、uh, do the same thing with code alone and not with this, but let's do it this way first. I'm going to scroll down to my list of objects down here. Oh, this looks familiar. Yellow icon, a yellow cube here. Let me go ahead and drag this object. Over to this list. Notice that it wants to snap into place at the bottom, so that's fine. I'm going to let go. And now I've told Xcode inside of this nib file when I run this program, instantiate or alloc for me an object that by default is just going to be an NS object. So that's pretty useless right now. But recall that we saw that thing called the identity inspector before, the thing that tells me what the class is for one of these icons. Well, let me keep it highlighted object, go over here. To my identity inspector, and indeed it's an NS object, but, ooh, this is familiar. Let's change this to a controller object. And now on the left hand side, the implication is when I run this program now and my nib file is deserialized and all of its contents are allocked, sort of automatically for me behind the scenes and wired up to connect together, now this is the equivalent of calling alloc on one controller object. So, this is great. This means now I have an object, which means now graphically I can take this, this example home. So, now I'm going to do this. There's, as always, a couple ways to do this. I'll show you two. If I、uh, control click, my goal here, to be clear, is I want to wire the button to the controller so that somehow I can talk to that button. All right, so what do I want to do here?、Um, well, let's do it with,、um, actually, let's do it with the text field in this direction. Let's go back to my controller. So, that we have one other outlet ready here. Actually, let's do this. Let's actually make it for the text field first. So, I'm going to change this to UI text field, not view. And I'm going to call this text field, just because I'd rather start the story there. I just have to make one tweak here、uh, text field equals text field. So, now story conceptually is the same, but I've changed what I want to wire up. So, I'm going to go back to my nib file. And what I want to do now is I'm going to drag from the text field to the controller. And notice it really wants to connect there. It's highlighting as I drag over it. As soon as I let go, I'm offered a list of. Whoops.、Uh, sorry. As soon as. There we go. Save that. As soon as I do that, sorry, wrong direction, because my outlet's defined in the controller, I'm going to control click on my controller, drag over here, and it wants to snap in this direction too. When I let go, notice that because I use that special new keyword, IB outlet, in my source code, Xcode is inferring, well, OK, a y this is the only thing he's said is going to be an outlet. So, how do I want to wire up the controller to that go button? I'm going to select text field. And so now what this means. And I don't see the line thereafter, but what this means programmatically is that when this controller class is instantiated and I get one such object, he's got a property called text field. That pointer, that property, is going to be automatically pointing at what object in memory? At the text field. So, this is as though, if you think back to C, I use the address of operator somehow on that thing called a text field. But because we're using this interface builder, a lot of those details are hidden from me. So, now the, to be clear, controller has a pointer to that text field, which means now I can change it. I can read what the user's typed in. It's nice. I just feel like I now have the potential for bi directional communication there. Now, what about the button? The button, and this is why I changed my mind earlier, the button, I kind of want to go in the other direction because when I click the button, Just you know, kind of intuitively, I want a method to get called, or something to happen, functionality. So in this case, I want Go to point to that. So the analog of IB outlet when going in this other direction for a method call is called a little something different. I'm going to create a,、uh, not a property here, but I'm going to create an instance method. And I'm going to specify, you know what, this instance method 
is in what's called an IB action, interface builder action. And this fun method, eh, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to call it go. It's going to take one parameter by default, which by convention is just going to be the sender. So ID is a generic pointer to an object. Sender is just the convention throughout all of the Apple documentation for um, whatever UI widget is supposed to be sending the message, sending the event from the user's finger to the code. And so that's all I need there. So let me go ahead and copy this now into my controller class, uh, specify that I'll implement it down here. And so now it's not going to do anything. NS log, but let's prove as much. NS log go, just so it's very clear in the debugging logs. So I've implemented an instance method called go, returns IB action, which is type def or sharp defined to be void. So really there's no magic here. It's just another hint to the compiler. And it's going to take one argument, which in this case is going to be a pointer to the button that I touch. So now let's go back to my nib file. And that looks like this. I'm going to control click on the go button. And notice my line is forming. I connect to the controller as soon as I let go. Aha, Xcode, because I typed IB action in my .h file, knows that I have these instance methods available to handle this event. I'm obviously going to choose the only one, go. It's going to flash to say, yep, that worked. And now I have conceptually a wire between controller and Go, as well as between controller and the text field. So let's see what happens now. Let me go ahead and run this. I'm going to go ahead and make sure my debugging log at the bottom is visible. And I'm going to roll it up a bit so it's more readable. All right, so now here is my interface. I'm going to go ahead and type my name and click Go. That's progress. Let's see. Indeed. Go. So now I have programmatic access to the button, it seems, and to the text field, but I'm not doing anything yet with the text field. So where can we go from here? Well, now let's pull the pre-baked uh, cake out of the oven. Let me go ahead and open up the finished version, and we'll see what connection remains to be made. So this is among your printouts tonight in source 9, nib 1. And what do we have here? Well, let's see what blanks I pulled in or filled in. So let's go to controller.m. What do I actually want to do with the event? Well, here's some new code. It's actually pretty straightforward, at least syntactically, now that we've had some background the past couple of weeks. It turns out that if I want to hide the text field, I need to send a message to the text field that essentially says, go away. And the method uh, by which that action goes is, uh, is, is called is called resign first responder. So we actually saw this jargon for first responder before. In general, when you touch a screen on an iOS device, any number of UI elements could respond. Maybe it's a text field. Field, maybe it's a button, maybe it's something that's overlaid on something else. The first guy to respond to an event triggered by the human is called the first responder. So when you send a message to a text field that says resign your first responder status, the idea is that that guy should go away. He should undo whatever it is he did in response to the touch. So you recall that if you touch the text field on an iOS device like I did with my mouse, what happens? Well, the keyboard comes up. Well, that's indicative of the key uh, text field having taken on first responder status. So if I'm tired of seeing that keyboard, I tell it to resign first responder status, and the keyboard will be go down. Self.textField, what is text field uh, programmatically here? It's a property in my .h file. So this means I'm going to send a message called resign first responder to that text field that will pull the keyboard down. At that point, I want to trigger a little alert that says, hello, David, or hello, Dan, or whatever the user typed in. So let's see the syntax for that. I have first an NS string pointer called s. I'm going to uh, create with the string with format method, hello, comma, percent at sign. What's percent at sign? It's placeholder for an NS string specifically, as opposed to a char star from C. What am I going to plug into there? Well, here is how you get access programmatically, not just to the text field, but the thing in the text field. Self.textField gives me the text field object. And because I read the documentation, I know it has a property called .text, which represents the value in that text field. So if you think back now to your DOM programming and JavaScript days with web stuff, JavaScript similarly can get an HTML input elements value field in much the same way. So that's going to say hello, comma, David, or whatever I typed in. Now I call another method. UI alert view star alert gives me a pointer 
to an object of type UI alert view, whatever that is. Now, what am I calling here? I'm apparently alloc、uh, allocing an object of that class. I'm initializing it in the same breath with a title, from a little title window for hello.、Uh, the message I'm sending it is S, whatever the string is I just constructed. The delegate, no, I don't know what that is. I'm going to ignore that for now. Uh, cancel button title is going to be thanks. So the default OK button, if you will, is just going to say thanks with an exclamation point. And then the other button titles, nil, I have no other buttons. So I'm just going to say nil. There's no array of button names there. And then what do I do? Well, this part's easy. I've got a pointer to that alert object. So I call the, or I pass it the show message. That will trigger the pop up. And then I'm free to release the memory. And I must release that object. Why? Because there's no garbage collection, and specifically or heuristically, because I called alloc, which means it's up to me to actually release it. So before we tease apart just a couple of other things I did behind the scenes, let me go ahead and run this program. We'll see a very familiar UI. At the top, I'm going to go ahead and click the name field, and I'm going to go ahead and type in my name. I'm going to click go, and voila, now I get a hello David pop up. And when I click thanks, it goes away. If I go back up here and change it to Dan and click go, It pops up. Excellent. If I go up here and click return, interesting. Nothing just yet, which maybe is okay. Now I click go and it works, but maybe we can improve that ever so slightly. But any questions on what we just did? Yeah.、Uh, does UI view run in a separate thread? No, it becomes modal and takes control of the screen there. Uh, core. That's a good question, actually. With the UI,、um, let me check and, and answer that correctly after break. Let me come back to that. Yeah. Ah, good question. At this point, I've not told it what to do when I click thanks, when I click the, the close button. It, will in it can, in fact, send a message to my code, but I've not done that yet. So, right now, it's by default going to close just by definition of the UI Alert View class. So, not when you've closed it.、Um, because at this point,、um, So, at this, this is my last moment to actually release this object. Generally, you want to release the objects in the same frame in which you allocked it. If show, the show message needs to trigger、um, retention of any of that memory, it can do it itself. It can retain the various properties that it needs to display. But let me come back to this because this is related to this question. Let me get it right after break with that answer. Yeah.、Um, to answer your question, I was reading one of the books you would recommend.、Mm -hmm. OK, a y yeah, so and then the related question then is the memory management while it's still local if this, this、uh, the next message gets called as well.、So. Yeah. Uh huh. All right, so let's, let's flesh out a couple more details here, and、um, I'll field a couple of those. Right after a break. So, what else did I add to here? So, it turns out that I did want to do something with、uh, one other event here. Let me go into mainwindow.nib again. And just as a sanity check, and this too is if you're handed code from a book or from a sample project from Apple, you can, simply, you can certainly infer what's going on here simply by right clicking or control clicking, and we'll see what's wired up here. Well, it turns out that I've apparently wired up an event. It's a little small to read. That's called did end on exit. And silly though the name is, this is the event that's triggered when you hit the enter or the return or the go button, whatever the bottom right button is in, that,、uh, UI, in the keyboard. What am I going to do when I call done? Well, when I if I want to make sure that the keyboard does get minimized when I hit that enter key, well, then I can invoke my own method in controller. Called done, which I didn't define when we were writing the code manually, but in the prefab version, notice that in my controller class, I do have one other IB action called done. And notice that in my controller.m file, I'm doing something very simple here. I'm just explicitly telling it to resign its first responder status. So there's two handlings here. I, if Uh, the user hits the enter key, I want the keyboard to go down, which it did in the prefab example. It didn't when we wrote it from scratch because we didn't get to this point. But only when the user clicks the go button do I want something interesting to happen with the UI alert view. 
So this feels like there's an opportunity for improvement here, right? I kind of like the user to be able to hit just intuitively the enter button or the return button and just have it work. Why do I have to close the keyboard and then click go? Well, conceptually, how could I make both of those events invoke the go method? What do I have to go back and tweak? If I want both the action of hitting enter on the keyboard and the go button itself that I dragged and dropped into the UI to invoke the go method. Yeah? The wires the text field to the exactly. So these wires in Interface Builder, they're not uh, beholden to a one-to-one -one relationship. You can wire the multiple outlets to the same action, or multiple events rather, to the same action. And so what we'll have here in our Second variant of this, nib2, is a slightly better version. In nib2, we'll have this behavior. So this too, you have printouts of. The code is almost identical to the previous version. But when I actually run and compile this code, what I see now is if I go up here and type in Dan and click Go, I get the behavior of the keyboard going down and the message popping up. Or I can more deliberately say, Tommy, Go. And now oh, that's interesting. The keyboard also resigned its first responder status. So how did I do this? Well, if I take a quick peek at my nib file and I right click on go, it seems to be wired up to what method? To go. So the touch up inside event is wired up to the go method. And if I do it on the text field, the did end on exit event is wired up to the go method as well. So either of those UI events will actually trigger invocation of that method. And so we get the same behavior no matter what path the user follows. Now, as an aside and as an alternative approach, you'll recall that before, when I wanted to wire up the Go button to my code, I control clicked on the button and dragged over to controller. But it seems to have inferred exactly which event I want. And sure enough, almost all of these UI widgets have a whole laundry list of possible events. When you do the control click, which is a little more intuitive, I think, but typically it will choose the most common event. And that was touch up inside and did end on exit. But if it ever doesn't quite work as behaved, realize that you can open this little pop up and instead explicitly drag the little circle next to the event you want to the object that you care about. Let's go ahead and take our five minute break. All right, so we are back. Lots of fun stuff to do. Um, quick response to the question about the UI alert, ver uh, UI alert view. So I couldn't find online a canonical reference to speak to this, but I believe what happens with the UI alert view is that when you call the show message, these alerts are added to some kind of back end queue where any information you need is actually retained, in which case it's OK for you yourself to then release that uh, UI alert view object. But let me try to find an authoritative um, reference among the online docs, and I'll post it to the help board to confirm as much. The UI alert view docs do not discuss that, but it's, uh, I know I've seen it somewhere. Uh, so one little, there's a couple other features that I'd be remiss in not pointing out so that all this code does make sense when you look through it at home. Notice this one little enhancement I, I did here. When I type in whatever, whoever's name, click go, and then, oh, did I, I broke the code, didn't I? Shouldn't have let me, did I click save? Let's see. Uh-oh, David click save. All right. So notice, let's turn this into a pedagogical learning exercise. So if I type something and your Go button has stopped working, what might possibly be the explanation? Yeah, so you recall right at the end of our tape there, I showed you how you could remove a wired up connection and then manually recreate it. And I started to recreate it, and then we stopped for break. Well, let's actually finish connecting that wire. So intuitively, though, hopefully that makes sense. If button's not doing anything, feels like there's maybe not a connection or just no code that you've actually written. But we know we have the code. So let's go into the nib file. Let me go ahead and either control click, or to be more deliberate this time, I'm going to right click and then find my touch up inside uh, event. And I'm going to click this little uh, plus next to it. And I'm going to drag from touch up inside all the way over to controller. I'm going to let go. Sure enough, there's my menu of uh, instance methods. I'm going to click go. Now I'm going to save it. And now we're back where it started. I'm going to go ahead and rerun the program. And so now when I type someone's name and then go, Notice that the message pops up, but notice what happens when I click thanks. Keep an eye on the text field at top. It goes back to the default, whereas in previous incarnations it left ASASAS or whatever the user had typed in. Yeah? Why did it not also show the 
the done method. So in, uh, in version, oh, so we're in nib2. So in here, I've removed the done method. Sorry, a little wave of the hand before. So nib2 simplifies, recall, by piping both of the actions, hitting the enter key and also hitting the go button, to the same method, go. Whereas in the previous example, nib1, we had the enter key essentially going to the done method, which we、uh, only glanced at. We didn't write manually. And the button that we dragged into the UI called the go method. But now I've collapsed that into one. Yeah? Good question. So let me scroll back to nib one and then I'll restate the question at hand. If I go into my M file for nib one's example, notice that I had two different methods here. The done method was wired up to the text field、uh, by、uh, way of the enter key essentially. And the go button was wired up to the go button. So done button goes to done, go button goes to go. So notice I use slightly different syntax here to resign the first responder. In the top case there, the done method, the guy I wired up to that method is the text field itself. So the sender object of type ID is going to be the text field object. So it suffices for me to say sender resign first keyboard because I know, because I did the wiring and I only did one wire, that it's going to be the text field object that gets that message. In this case, the go button, the sender object is going to be a pointer not to the text field but to the, the go button. And so here I have to be a little more careful as to who I'm resigning first responder status. But thankfully, because of our very first activity when we created an IB outlet for the text field, I have programmatic access to the text field, even if he has not triggered this event. So I can still send the text field that same message.、Um, the implication here is I could also have used self.textField at top, but I simply chose to distinguish the two. But Either approach would have worked. Now in nib2, recall that again, the takeaway was to wire both actions, the keyboard、uh, hitting enter and also the go button being touched with the finger to the same single method called go. But the little、uh, sugar on top of this. Version was that I also cleared the text field. Now, I only cleared the text field though, not when the user clicked go or enter, but rather only when the user clicks thanks, the actual button. So now I somehow need programmatic access to that UI. Alert view, but as you pointed out, we already released him when I actually allocked him, sent the message send, and then released him. So, how do I get programmatic access here? Well, here again is some asynchronicity. So long as I proactively tell the UI alert view that he needs to get back to me when he is done displaying on the screen, I can register what's generally called a delegate. We used this word before in the context of the application delegate. Here I can have a met-、uh, another class, an- another object. Whose purpose in life is to just respond to messages from things like UI alert views and do something in response to that button being clicked. Now, how does this work? Well, if I take a look in my controller H file, notice that I didn't do this the first time. What protocol does my custom controller actually implement? UI alert view delegate. Well, what is that thing? Well, little trick in Xcode, hold down option when in doubt, and little dot dashed lines will appear under any interesting symbol. I'm going to go ahead and click with option held, and I get this little cheat sheet here. This gives me a little abstract summary of what this thing is. If I click here, I get the full documentation for it. If I click here, I get the header file for it. I prefer to read the, he-、uh, the documentation because it's a little more user friendly. So I click that. Here is the official documentation for the UI delegate, and it looks like If I implement a class that implements this protocol, that means my class may be sent any number of messages. And they're all listed here. The one I actually care about is the one that I actually implemented. So let's go to my .m file in controller.m and notice it's a little ugly with this font size, but notice I have implemented the alert view did dismiss, did dismiss with button index method. And what does this thing do? Well, it takes a pointer to the alert view, which I don't need to care about because I wrote the program. I know there's only one alert view. It also gets an integer from zero on up that denotes which of the multiple buttons were clicked. But recall that I only had one button, so that number isn't interesting to me. But the action I take when thanks is clicked is up to me. So I'm going to do self.textField.text, and I'm setting it to nil. And the effect of setting a text field's text property to nil. 
is to just null it out. And it becomes the empty string again, and the placeholder text returns. So notice again the various decouplings that are happening here. So besides our whole startup story for tonight, where main is passing off to UI application, which is passing off to nib1 app delegate, which then is passing off to my code, in this case the controller. Well, in this case here, I kind of have communication yet more indirectly. When I click thanks on the UI alert view, it invokes code that I wrote, but I had to proactively tell the, um, uh, the alert view which object it needs to send that did dismiss message to. So how do I do that? Well, notice in my controller code, in this go method, I made a very simple change. And the answer to this question lies here. How did the alert view know to which object to send that did dismiss method? Well, this time I didn't specify nil as my delegate. I specified myself as the delegate, self being akin to this in Java. So all that's doing is it's telling the alert view, whenever you have messages to tell the world, send them to me. And so long as I implement this method, which I did in this very same file as a separate instance method, I named identically to the documentation, which to be clear, if I wanted to use this thing, I literally can just copy and paste the signature into my own code and then go to town and start implementing it like I did here. That method will actually handle the message when passed to self, when passed to me. So again, this is a very common paradigm. And so now, hopefully, whereas we looked at protocols last week, fairly much out of context, now it's maybe making a little more sense. Yeah. Nope, just stretching. All right, so let's quickly implement the same thing in code. Um, I would suggest for the first project that you'll actually find it a little more pleasurable, a little more lower impact to use Interface Builder, um, mostly, entirely for the UI. But just so we've seen it, let me give us a quick tour of how we might implement this same program but in code. And a question in the back as I open this up. Uh, yeah. Oh, good question. Yes. So I know where you're going with this. How did I magically go from nib1 to nib2, whereby in the first example, my return key on the keyboard just said return in black and white text. But in version 2, it was actually a go button. Well, we can see that here. If I open up nib1 again and go into Xcode project and run this, just to be clear what I'm talking about, in version 1, it just says return in the bottom right corner. Kind of uninteresting, but pretty typical. All right. If I instead open version 2, it instead looks a little sexier and a little more inviting. Instead, the return key now is go, and it's in blue in the bottom right-hand corner. How did I do that? Well, to be honest, it's actually kind of uninteresting to do that, even though it does make things a little sexier. If I open up the right-hand pane here and open up my nib file and click on the text field, and go to my attributes inspector. There's a lot of juicy things here that I actually uh, prefabbed but didn't talk about, but you can certainly play with the upcoming project. I chose to enable some features and disable others. You might know on iOS devices, it can capitalize words or sentences for you automatically. You can enable or disable spell checking correction, uh, the key type of keyboard you're using, whether it's numeric or uh, alphabetical or email or URL oriented. Uh, the return key, I chose go from the drop down instead of return. So so in short, certainly for the first uh, choice project, feel free to tinker and just save often so that you can um, restore from backup if you break things or don't remember how you got somewhere. But that's all that was. And we'll see that actually in code, I think, in just a moment. So in no nib, for which you also have printouts, Let's do a quick tour of the nib file. And as the name implies, even though I do have a nib file, despite the project's name, I didn't do anything with it. This was the minimal template. I chose a window-based application when I started this project. I called it no nib. And I do indeed get some default icons at top left. I get my app delegate. And that's good, because it means someone's going to take responsibility for this application. I get a window object, which is good, because the user can actually see me. But that's it. I didn't actually drag and drop any widgets. I didn't add any IB outlets or actions. That was uh, relegated to my previous two examples. So I instead did this guy entirely in code. So in my app delegate, notice I have some property as before. And I didn't point this out last time. And I didn't use it last time either. But we'll see in a bit when we look at some of the built-in MVC templates that Xcode comes with. It's probably useful longer term and for more uh, sophisticated projects to keep around a pointer 
to your controller object. And I can do this by way of declaring it in my、uh, .h file so that I can later have access to it.、Uh, so uh, you'll see if you poke around the outlets that were in Interface Builder for nib1 and nib2, that one thing that I didn't point out but was there, there was actually a pointer, a wire between the app delegate and my controller object. So I dragged in that example in advance of class. From files owner down to the controller object. So you don't have to drag left to right. You can even drag among these icons here to wire things up. But this example is all about doing it in code. So the H file is pretty simple. I seem to have two properties one pointing to my text field and one pointing to something called a view, which I'll come back to in just a moment. And then I have a UI alert view. Oh, it looks like I kind of copied and pasted from my last example. I like the functionality, but I wanted to implement it from scratch. So I copied and pasted my signatures here. I I preemptively defined these two properties, but notice I did not use my new keyword, IB outlet, because that's Interface Builder. I'm not using it. So let's see the .m file as to how I do this. Well, conceptually, what I want to implement is this same idea of the window. So I've got two things I want to slap onto this window I've got, a UI, I've got a UI label and a UI button. And it turns out it's a little easier rather than slapping them onto the window itself. What I'm going to do first is allocate a very generic, very empty rectangle that's just called UI view. So a transparency, if you will. And I'm going to slap on top of that the label, at, rather the、uh, text field, and the button. And then I'm going to hand that UI view, attached to which are two other widgets, I'm going to hand that to the actual window. And we'll see how to do this relatively easily. So, first line of code is just an incarnation of what I predicted, which is this thing here. I want to create a view. So, I preemptively decided, as you saw, that I'm going to have a view property. We saw that in the .h file, just so I can remember this rectangular transparency that I'm preparing here. How do I instantiate a very empty rectangle,、uh, rectangular view? I call UI view alloc. Then I init it, initialize it with what's called a frame. A frame, as we'll、uh, increasingly see, refers to some geographic region of the screen. I want this view to take up the whole screen, so I know from the documentation that I can access something called UI screen. Main screen, which almost always gives you access to the glass of the screen. If you have one of those fancy new VGA or DVI cables, you can actually access a secondary screen using similar code. But for now, we're almost always talking about my own primary screen called main screen. That has a property called application frame, which just happens to be a geographic rectangle that I need to steal the coordinates of for my own view to make it fill the screen. So that's it there. Now I create a text field. And this is why people start to use XBuilder. So, If I want to create a little pretty Apple like text view, here we go.、Uh, I go a、uh, text field, here we go. I first create one of these things called rect,、uh, rectangles or frames,、uh, core graphics rect. So, this is a sneak preview of some of the 2D graphics capabilities of iOS. So, I'm going to create a frame that's of these dimensions 20,、uh, let's see,、uh, 280 pixels wide, 31 pixels tall. Uh, 20, oriented 20 pixels from the top of the screen and 20 pixels from the left of the screen. Now, how in the world did I figure out where I want to put this thing? Well, you can do trial and error. You can assume that the device's dimensions are uh, 320 uh, by uh, uh, 480, and you can manipulate your content within those bounds、uh, by trial and error. Or, frankly, you can do what I did, and you can use Interface Builder to kind of lay things out. And then you can cheat and figure out where things ended up. And copy and paste those numbers. So I liked where this thing ended up. So I clicked it once. And I clicked on view over here. And I clicked the ruler, which we haven't yet seen, which is the size inspector. And look at that. There's my 20, 40, but I changed it intentionally to 80 and 31. So that's where I stole those numbers from. Yeah. Good question. Is there a way to set your properties in Interface Builder and script it out? No. You, everything will get serialized into the XML file. It will not auto generate the code for you. But as an aside, just less, it's kind of a fun but not necessarily useful feature. Let me point out one thing now that I still have nib1 open. You may recall earlier that I intentionally declared my IB action first so that I would have an endpoint when dragging and dropping that wire. If I, didn't, if I weren't that smart and I didn't think of writing the hooks in my code first, one of the new features of Xcode 4 is actually this. Let me delete my declaration of Go. Let me delete my function Go. All right, I just accidentally clicked save, so we will never again see nib1 here tonight. 
Now, notice there's no mention of the go method, the go action. Well, if I now open up my nib file, this won't fit terribly well on the projector screen here, but there's this assistant editor, the little guy in the butler outfit here. And what that will generally do is guess which file you probably want to interact with if on the left hand side you have this other file open. Here it guessed right, otherwise you can change it via the top menu there. But what I want to do now is create the go IB action, and maybe I never remember the syntax, maybe I'm lazy, maybe I just think this is cool. Turns out one of the new features that's kind of making programming like drag and drop, but then quickly stops thereafter. Let's go ahead and control click on go, drag a little arrow, not this way. But this way, and this looks kind of cool, now let me let go there, I get a little pop-up. I don't want an outlet, I want an action, because go triggers an action, so I say action. What do I want the name of this thing to be? Go. What is the type of it? It's going to be ID. What event do we want to handle? Touch up inside. What do you want to call the argument sender? Okay, so I'm going to click connect. Whew, wasn't that useful. <laughs> um, so it kind of is. It helps you maybe visually wire things from code, uh, from GUI to code, as opposed to this random kind of intermediate object visualization. But realize that feature is now there. But we're getting rid of the GUI features, uh, or the interface builder aspect. We're building this thing from scratch. So here is my text field's dimensions, which I can make almost anything, though some of them are sized to default values. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and set a few properties. How did I come up with all these properties? Frankly, just by reading through the documentation figuring out which ones do which, trial and error, and I'm setting a few of them. So first, I'm assigning to my own property called text field the result of allocating a text field object, initializing it with that frame. So at this point, I do have a text field. It's going to fill that space on the screen and be located 20 pixels by or 20 points by 20 points from the top left-hand corner of the screen. But it doesn't have auto completion. It doesn't have go. It instead has the more boring return and all of that. So these various properties that I proceed to set after that are the result of reading through the. Uh, documentation, turning on auto capitalization, turning on auto correction, changing the border style, changing the vertical alignment, and so forth. It's just, again, uh, a whole lot of properties that we're setting. As an aside, you'll see that these things are not class constants. So Objective-C doesn't have class constants. It has instance variables. So much like in the world of C and C++, you instead have these global constants, uh, which are implemented by way of enum and typedef, which we did see two lectures ago. So almost any time you see these sort of special values here, they represent constants that are documented in the documentation. But underneath the hood, this might be the number 1, this might be 3, 5, 7, whatever. They are just enumed integral values that have useful symbol names. But that's why they tend to be very long, so that there's no name collisions in what otherwise is an unnamespaced environment. All right, so let's assume that all of that, most of that fanciness is aesthetic. The juicy lines are the first two only. The rest just re-implement everything I did with the attributes inspector via the GUI. But the interesting stuff starts to happen here. I'm telling the text field to listen for that did end on exit event. And that's the event that gets triggered when you hit return or go or whatever it's branded as. So I send a message to my text field of add target action for control events. Uh, and that's it. So what do I send to myself? What do I send to myself? Well, I specify that the target of this event is going to be self. What method do I want to invoke? What UI action, if you will, do I want to invoke? Well, I want to invoke the method called go colon, and it's go colon, not just go, because go does take an argument, takes an ID called sender. But unlike C, when you can just pass functions by name, uh, by pointer, here you pass them by their full name, but you wrap it with the selector keyword. So at selector, parentheses, the name of a method is essentially a, a hint to the compiler, go look up the address of this method so that I know how to pass it to another method as an argument here. So this is essentially how you pass one method to another without, act, without actually invoking it right there. What control events do I want to call go for? Well, this crazy long thing name, but you can infer from it that it's indeed consistent with what I predicted here in the comment. That is the formal name for the did end on exit event. So here too is kind of a frustration, I think, with 
interface builder in Xcode, a lot of the UI is kind of dumbed down. They'll call it did end on exit, but as a programmer, you kind of need to know that it's really called this. So I think you'll find sometimes that the simplifications to pseudo English don't necessarily help. They kind of cover up more details than would be ideal. So just realize those are one and the same. And now let me wave my hand at some of these details because it kind of gets boring to implement UIs with just very pedantic method calls. But how do I now add the text field I just created to that rectangular transparency that I allocated at the very top of this method? Well, I call self.view. Self.view is referring again to that empty rectangle that I allocated to fill the screen. Add subview. So I refer to these things as subviews. When you slap one widget on top of another like this, you're adding a subview to the parent object. So add subview allows me to add the text field to that rectangular view. And at this point, I can release the text field because if the parent view cares about it, it will have called a retain on it to keep it around. Now the button. Uh, similar con concepts, the first two lines are the interesting ones. Those are the crazy dimensions by default for a button that will fit the word go. Then I allocate the actual button. I give it a frame uh, that is identical to what I created there. And then I'm going to listen for the touch up inside event with very similar syntax. I add the button to my view. And then by convention, I return self. This was, to be clear, my init method and how you would alternatively implement a GUI without using Interface Builder. And I do need to uh, do not need to release the button. So there's one difference here in how I declared these buttons. So indeed, I have a button object in memory here, but I used one of these convenience methods whereby I did not call alloc, which means if I did not call alloc, I did not call copy, I did not call new, I did not call retain, I do not therefore need to call release. So it was in fact auto released behind the scenes. Good point, though. All right, and the rest of the code, to be honest, pretty much the same. Although one thing worthy of note, in my dalloc method of my controller, notice I have to release that text field because in my um, well, why? So text field is a property. In nib one and nib two, I manually wired it to my GUI with Interface Builder. In this version of the code, I actually connected it programmatically. But I'm releasing it here. But I don't remember writing any code here, even though we went through this one fast. I don't remember writing any code that retained text field. In fact, if I do a command F here and search for retain, it's not found. I never once retained text field. So why in the world am I in my dalloc method, which will get called at the very end of my controller's useful life, am I releasing something I never retained? Sorry? Uh, preference? Uh, not, oh, reference property. So it actually derives from properties. So what is text field? Well, recall in my .h file that I indeed had a couple of, um, where'd it go? I had a couple of properties. One of them is this view. One of them is my text field here. And notice what I specified as the attributes for this property. I specified retain. And I'm using my getter and my setter that are automatically synthesized for that property in my .m file. So way up here where I call, let's see, way up here where I call text, 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 text. Oh, damn it. I'm telling the wrong story. <laughs> text field, that's self that text field release. Did that. Let me quickly correct myself as though this never happened. <laughs> I did that. Sorry. I'll fix this in the online code. It's my view I want to release. All right, so I already released my text field, which I did alloc, and we very we are we explicitly told that story. But pretend I just retold that same story, but using view instead of text field. But I never actually called retain view anywhere. In fact, all I ever did with regard to the view after creating that rectangle that fills the whole screen is I did this, self.view. But dot implies a properties usage, either a getter or setter. In this case, there's an assignment e operator, the equal sign, which means the setter is invoked. Because of the way I declared this property, the setter actually uses a retain call which means I am indeed retaining that view object, which means it is indeed up to me in my dalloc method to actually release that thing at the very end of my controller's useful life. All right, so quick 
debugging tip since we would have seen it actually in that, well, we wouldn't necessarily have seen it in that example there. Unfortunately, when you forget to dealloc things at the very end of your program's life cycle, you tend not to notice them because the application will typically get killed and therefore all the memory is freed up anyway. But I did, uh, let, me, let me dive into this real quick and then come back to the question. What I did do in advance is I kind of intentionally wrote a leaky application just so we can get a teaser as you dive into the student choice project of some of the tools that are built in here. So this is leaky, the leaky project. It's among your printouts. And it's actually very simple. All it is here, if I run this application, is a little window that pops up. And it gives me a button that very invitingly says, press me. So I'm going to press it, press it. And what appears to be happening in the console? Yeah, so it's obviously counting how many times I've pressed it. So there's some kind of state maintenance there. It's maybe it's an instance variable. Maybe it's a static local variable. But somehow it's keeping track of how many times I click this. Well, what might be going on behind the scenes here? Well, let's take a look at this thing. I seem to have some new files. But I'm going to wave my hands at some of the details before we start to peel back these layers. So I'm going to go into my view controller at the one method I care about. I, in advance of class, created that GUI and interface builder. It took me like five seconds to drag the button and rename it press me. Then I wired it up to a method called press, which I declared in my .h file to be an IB action. So I was able to do that wiring. So I, I'm moving away from doing everything in code. I'm instead doing it back with interface builder and IB outlets and actions. And this is it. Four lines of code with some helper code wrapping it. But this is really all I wrote here. A static int in C, uh, C++, Objective-C, if you declare a variable inside a method as being static, it initializes it the first time, but retains its value even after the method returns. So with the first time, n is 0. But every time I call this method again, it's going to be incremented because of that 1. It won't be reset after subsequent calls to 0 again. And all I'm doing in this uh, code is I'm creating a string with alloc, and I'm initializing it to be with my nice format string, the value. What am I not doing, though? Yeah, so I'm not releasing it. So newbie mistake, very simple example, but that's good because it means we can very easily find this mistake. But how can you find mistakes like this more generally? Well, it turns out you can do a number of things. So at the top left of my screen here, Notice that the Run button is only one of four options. There's two others for now that are actually quite useful. Analyze will do a static analysis of your code and try to find those mistakes uh, in your code without even running it. So I'm going to go ahead and analyze my code. And indeed, notice what happened pretty quickly is I'm getting yelled at in a couple of places. Let's look at top left first. The static analyzer found that, hmm, memory issue. Potential leak of an object allocated on line 20 and stored into S. If you don't fix a bug that's explicitly pointed out to you as that, it's unfortunate, because that's pretty damn uh, precise advice. Now, where else is it you're you seeing it? Well, you're also seeing it in blue here. I mean, it's really calling your attention to where this error might be. Now, in fairness, it's not always going to be that straightforward. This is deliberately a very simple example. But the heuristics are the same. It's certainly good as you start building up your application. And I would do this in the middle, not at the end, to try to chase down these things in advance. Um, it's very it's pretty good at finding such things, at least for simple logic. For more sophisticated examples, I can actually profile my code while it's running in case it's actually a runtime issue, like a, a branch that doesn't always get executed. And so I'm only sometimes releasing some memory. So if I profile and not analyze my code, the code will get built. Uh, this tool called Instruments will pop up with a very inviting, user-friendly template scheme here. The only one we'll look at for now is the one called Leaks. It's very fun looking here. But there are some others. There's one where you can profile your CPU usage, um, threading, which won't be quite applicable here, allocating, just how much memory are you actually using. So if you tinker with this, especially as you get more comfortable with Xcode, it can give, start to give you insights into where some hot spots are, where you're maybe iterating way too many times. Maybe you should uh, fine tune this where you're allocating too much memory, where you're never releasing memory, all of which can contribute to, um, one, your application crashing, or um, just as feasibly, your application being terminated by the iOS device. Um, you'll find throughout the documentation there is various limits, some official, some unofficial, whereby if your application is taking more than like 20 seconds to start up, uh, the iOS device is just going to kill it, and the user won't ever be able to use that application. So this is sort of Apple's heavy-handed approach to making sure that there's some baseline of reasonable behavior in all applications. So let's use leaks. I'm going to click the leaks icon, click profile. I get a new window here as my 
simulator runs in the background. Uh, you might have to log into your computer sometimes so that it can insert the right hooks. And now some interesting stuff is happening. It's kind of overwhelming at first, but notice what's good at this point is that I may have allocked some memory at the top there. That blue chart signifies some memory was allocated. Really good though. Next to leaks, there's nothing, which means I'm not leaking memory yet. But that makes sense. When am I going to leak memory? Yeah, when I press the button and the leaky method is actually called. So let's go ahead and start pressing me. And that's interesting. Now something's popping up there. If you get impatient as an aside, notice that if you configure the leaks profiler here, right now it's only going to look for leaks every 10 seconds by default. So if you really want to uh, be impatient, you can tell it to keep checking every second, and then you'll see more going on uh, more quickly. So blue and red is bad. So anything next to leaks is bad. It means you're leaking some information. OK, so that's useful, but be more useful if it told me where. So let me stop my program from running, because the instruments tool will have kept some useful information around. And what can I do at this point? Well. Graphically, I see the leaks. Down here, I see a row by row description of what blocks were leaked and what types of objects were occupying that memory. Looks like I clicked the button probably 18 times, so I have 18 leaks. Let me go ahead and expand this row here. And what I'll see here is that, wow, I have leaked memory at each of these various pointer addresses. Now, oh, this is kind of encouraging. It looks like the guy responsible for this memory leak is Apple, right? The foundation <laughs> class is leaking memory. Um, but of course, that just means that you called some function that somehow built into that library. You're probably the guy at fault. So the responsible frame, this too, isn't really all that helpful. But notice this. Let me go ahead and click that arrow next to the pointer to dive in for a little more detail and see if I can't wrap my mind around this issue. So now, this is getting a little more interesting. It looks like now the event, so to speak, that caused this memory leak somehow relates to malloc. Even though you won't generally call malloc yourself, it's a C function for memory allocation. It does signify that there's some allocation going on that um, is not uh, being released ultimately. So let me do this. Let me zoom out. And let me open up, just like in Xcode itself, this right-hand view for more information, which is hidden by default. If I click that, oh, interesting. So this is kind of a long list, which kind of suggests that there's a lot of mistakes throughout the foundation class. But the only ones you should care about are the ones with the black profile, which means you wrote this code. So I wrote main. I wrote leaky view controller, which is kind of a good hint too as to where the bug might be. And indeed, it's mentioning the selector press. So if I dive in there now by clicking this little hint over there and double click, it's going to highlight with as good accuracy as it can muster um, the line of code that triggered that memory leak. So long story short, if you suspect or if you just want to make sure your code doesn't have um, memory leaks in it, you can certainly statically analyze it, but that won't catch anything. You can profile it for some number of seconds or minutes, then go through the log to see if there's actually been any leaked blocks and chase down more sophisticated bugs. So what would be the resolution? Just a S release? Exactly. So the resolution to this problem would very simply, not in instruments, but if I go back into Xcode, would be to add S release here. Or if we want to apply some of last week's lessons, I could instead say up here, auto release. And it's wrapping because of the font here. But what that would do is plop a pointer to this object in the so-called auto release pool, which means generally after this method returns, that pool is going to be drained because it's drained at the end of any interesting event cycle. And touching the button is one such event cycle. So that would also solve this problem here. In general, this is probably a lazy habit to get into. Using auto release is probably better in general when you're writing a method that needs to return an object that you allocked, and therefore you're losing control of it. So you better auto release it. But if you are in full control of the whole method here, best if you proactively release it yourself and not risk piling stuff onto the auto release pool out of laziness. Yeah? If your method is returning something that the caller wants to keep for a long time mm -hmm. and you auto release it, doesn't that cause a problem if the caller doesn't retain it? Uh, if you are returning a um, if you're returning an object that the caller wants to keep around for a long time and he doesn't retain it, but he wants to keep it around for a while, yes, that's a problem by definition. If he wants to keep it around for a while, he must retain it. Otherwise, it's a bug in the caller's code. Okay, so if you auto-release it, 
does that create a window when it could be garbage collected as the event? Uh, so never say garbage collected in the context of iOS, but rather um, auto by specifying auto release, you're not actually releasing it or auto releasing it. You're telling the runtime to a call release on this object when the pool that's currently accessible to me, the pool of memory, is itself drained. Now, if there's a caller in this process, the caller is going to be obviously called before this method, which means the event cycle won't be completed until the caller is done executing, which means he has ample time to call retain before there's any risk of the pool being drained. Okay, this might, this might be very bad, but let's suppose you have a super class. Okay. There's no caller. The button is clicked, and you grant an object and stuff it into a field that exists for that purpose in the, the parent. Okay. And you ought to release it. Okay. It could be, could be destroyed before the parent gets a chance to do anything with it. Uh, so if you, okay, so long story short, if you are a child of a super class and the parent class wants to keep around a pointer to an object that the child class is allocking, the parent has to, has to, has to retain that object as, by, as through a, a property that has the retain attribute specified to actually keep it around. So the, long story short, the scenario you described, it does not have any risks of uh, uh, the pool being drained before the parent has an opportunity to retain it. But let me, for time's sake, let me come back to that after class. But in short, not a worrisome problem there. Yeah? Oh, very frequently does the IDE auto save your files. Um, I'm not sure with what frequency. Uh, well, so let me actually retract that slightly. So in Xcode, the files will remain grayed when you have not explicitly saved it yourself. I've not paid close enough attention to see. It's prop. Uh, I don't know in the latest version. I would trial and error, to be honest, as to how often they're actually auto saved. They're not auto saved after you make single edits, certainly, or even a few, because the file remains grayed. And maybe it, it might be doing auto saving in the background, but not something that's unrecoverable. If you quit and reopen the file, yeah. It's okay. It's not. So when you in C, C++, in Objective C, when you specify that a local variable is static, that means the compiler will make sure to allocate space for that variable once, not in that stack frame, but external to that stack frame, so that the memory allocated for n, those 32 bits, will be preserved after every subsequent call. So the only time n is set to 0 is the very first time through this method. PHP is a similar mechanism, for instance. Correct. It's still local. The n is still local, but its memory is reused and only initialized once, the very first time through the method's invocation. You, would re you can reset it by just saying at the bottom, not n++, but n equals 0, semicolon. That's all. So static coupled with on the same line an assignment operator induces that special behavior. Yeah. Uh, in Interface Builder, is there an assumption that you're in a specific orientation? Generally, by default, it assumes portrait up, so sort of normal mode. Um, but we will, in actually just a moment, introduce the notion of auto-rotating and handling multiple views. So we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. Let me point out one other thing that you're probably familiar with in spirit from uh, Eclipse or whatever other IDE command line or GUI that you use. But notice at the bottom of, e of um, Xcode has been this window. Whenever we're running your, our code, we've used nslog to print messages out there. But notice, and I think I did this a while back, if I actually wanted to see what was going on inside this thing, I can click in the sidebar to the left of my source code, setting what's called a breakpoint. Then I can go ahead and run this code. And execution will get paused at the point at which that blue arrow appears, which at this point is right then and there. So notice, or rather not yet, I have to press the button so that method gets invoked. If I click press me, notice that something stopped. It's telling me the thread one, the one and only thread here, stopped at breakpoint one. Down here, if you're familiar, you have access to the command line version of GDB and the various print commands and such. Uh, but a little more user friendly is the left hand panel, which I can pop open with this icon here. 
And now what I'll see, actually, let me split the view. So on the right hand side is the thing we've been seeing for two weeks. On the left hand side now is a summary of all of the objects and variables that are in scope at this point in the story. So uh, FYI, we won't go into the usage of this because it's probably familiar from Eclipse in your past, but this is indeed the built-in debugger for uh, Xcode based on GDB where you can navigate your code and then thanks to these little play buttons and such, you can start to walk through your code line by line and step through it as needed. So that coupled with instruments are very excellent habits to get into uh, both proactively and also reactively when you know you have some bug in play. Let me forge ahead just for time's sake and um, take some remaining questions at the tail end. So that was instruments and GDP. Let's now stop writing everything from scratch. So I'm going to go ahead now and create a new project. We're going to move away for now from the window-based application because I'm really getting tired, three examples now, of making that same controller class again and again. And in fact, my programs up until now have been kind of buggy and kind of stupid looking. If I open up nib2 or nib or no nib or nib1 and actually run this thing, well, on, in the real world, I could rotate my device physically. In the simulator, I can rotate it with keyboard shortcuts or the menu. And this is kind of a stupid program at this point, right? Surely we can do better with a almost perfectly symmetric device. We can actually have this thing rotate automatically. So how can we go about doing this? Well, we could really kind of write some low-level code ourselves, or we can start to leverage some of the built-in SDK um, templates that are provided and some of the classes that we've not been touching just yet. So this time around, I'm going to create a new Xcode project. I'm going to choose view-based application. And at this point in the story, this is probably the simplest template, window-based application. This is the next simplest. And then the, raw, the other four, with the exception of OpenGL, are kind of equivalent in that they add new functionality that you've probably seen on iOS devices. So we'll glance at those quite quickly this week in more detail in the uh, future. I'm going to go ahead and call this uh, thing a view. I chose view-based app application. All right, so now let's just run this thing to see what I get. Not much of anything. Does rotate, no bugs yet, at least. Well, kind of. Actually, my bar is not rotating. But let's see what's in here. So if I look among all of my files and groups over here, I've got a lot of similar files. I see a familiar main.m under supporting files. I see main window.nib, but there's a few other things now. So now it turns out that because iOS and macOS development are so uh, focused around MVC, most of the templates that come with Xcode actually have this idea of the C, at least, and the V built into the distribution code. They tend not to come with an M, because the M is really up to you to come up with. You're writing about students or something else. But in this case, I have a few more files created for me. One, viewappdelegate.hnm. Those are just like the ones we've seen before. But I'm also getting now three new ones. View, or stupid name, view view controller view view controller dot m view view controller dot nib so h m and nib so what's inside of these well let's go ahead and open up the nib file for main window and we'll see there's not all that much there but there is an object allocated by way of this nib called what view view controller now we did this like half an hour ago i manually created essentially this scenario by dragging and dropping a generic object and changing its class to be controller Apple has now done this for me and inserted these silly spaces to make it look a little more user friendly, but it's just now my automatically generated class called viewviewcontroller.m. I called mine controller, made more sense. They call it viewviewcontroller. And so let's take a look at what file Apple has handed to me. So in viewviewcontroller.h, thankfully, super simple. But unlike mine, which descended from what object? Or from what class? NS object. Apple's controller that they've prefabbed for me, and Apple by convention calls controllers view controllers, and as much as they control views, they're just being a little more specific. Theirs apparently descends from a class called UI view controller. What's nice now, and this is the one you should probably use moving forward, at least for anything that's template based, is that there's some methods that are associated with this class and some properties that are just useful. And among them are screen rotational capabilities that otherwise I would have had to deal with implementing myself. Now I just have to return a value, true or false, yes or no, do I want the screen to rotate, essentially. So there's nothing in that .h file. What about the .m file? 
Well, in the .m file, here are some of those methods that I mentioned are now standardized. There's a dalloc, of course. There's did receive memory warning, so that's interesting. There's now view did load, view did unload, should auto rotate to interface orientation. So that's kind of a fun one. And so now, let me go ahead and close out the template that I just created so that I don't have to type it all out from scratch, but instead go to the class called view controller, which is among tonight's printouts. I started this program by using the view-based template, which we just did. Then I kind of copied and pasted most of my code from the previous examples into Apple's templates, so that whereas in my old code that I wrote myself, my class was called controller. Again, in this version, it's called view controller, which I gave the name of. So main.m looks the same. Mainwindow.nib looks the same. View controller, view controller, poor choice of names, partly, half my fault, half theirs, um, is quite reminiscent of the UI that we created in the previous versions. But now notice that this is the view controller, view controller .nib. So this is going to be associated with the view controller. I, better names next time around. So how is this working? Well, we all, all, when in doubt, when confused, just start back at the beginning. Look at main.m, looks the same. Look at UI application. Well, UI application always punts to something called delegate. Well, in this case, it's going to be the view controller delegate. Well, here's that class. Well, what is implemented here? Almost all of this code is identical to everything we've seen before, but there's one new line in this view-based template. The one new line that's interesting is this one here. I'm sorry, two new lines, and this one here. So built into the UI window class is support for one super powerful view controller. I didn't access or utilize this property before because I was kind of inventing my own controller based on my MVC lessons that I learned. But now I can start to leverage some sort of built-in support for MVC. And I am synthesizing what's apparently a property called view controller. It's going to be of type UI view controller. And we saw that in the .h file. And I'm going to remember that view controller by way of a special property called root view controller, whose name suggests that this is somehow important. It's the root view controller that's just going to take over control of my whole application. So if you don't mind one more punting of this, the iOS framework, we had main.m delegating to the UI application. The UI application delegated to its delegate. Who is the delegate now delegating to effectively? A view controller. But this is nice now, because now all of my code gets isolated to any of the view controllers that I write or that Apple's provided some framework code for me. So now, notice what I can add to my view controller class. Because I'm using some of Apple's built-in stuff, this is all copy and paste from before. So it shouldn't be overwhelming, copy paste from before. But scroll down, and I added one extra method. Should auto rotate interface orientation? And I don't even care about supporting some but not all. I'm going to return yes to any question relating to auto orientation. So now let me go ahead and save and run this version of my code. And what we'll see here is that now, same program as before. I get my little keyboard, it pops up, I can click go and such. But if I rotate my device, now it rotates here. So now it's feeling like a saleable application. But notice what's interesting too. Everything's remaining nicely centered, and that actually doesn't happen automatically. Notice how the text field is growing to fill the screen. But I'm pretty sure when we built this, both with the interface builder and with uh, code, I'm pretty sure we knew what the fixed dimensions, width, and height were. So what's going on there? Well, another feature now of interface builder or of the code you could write manually, notice if I click on this element here, and look at the top right, sure enough, there are those dimensions. But Xcode also supports, both graphically and then through code, things called struts and springs. So this is actually kind of a nice interface. And we're getting a little preview of what's going to happen here. I've selected my text view. Conceptually, no matter what orientation the phone is in, I just want that text field to grow and fill the glass, no matter whether it's long or tall. So what I want to do is specify with these struts, maintain the same left margin maintain the same right margin, maintain the same top margin. I don't care about the bottom margin. Let it grow down to as big as it wants. But stretch out, spring out horizontally. Because if I disable this and don't tell it to spring out in this way, notice you'll see a little preview here. The red dot represents graphically the text view. So now I'm getting the ability to much more dynamically create interfaces that grow to fill the screen both for the iPhone and for the iPad. So we're just about there when it comes to your implementation of Evil Hangman. So section tonight, walkthrough Thursday, lecture Tuesday. We'll see you uh, next time.